Good evening. Kalispera says. It's, thank you so much for coming. Uh, my name is Michael Cosmopoulos. I am the chair of Greek studies here at the University of Missouri, St. Louis. And I would like to welcome you and our audiences across the world because we are broadcasting live internationally right now. <laughs> so, yeah. And I, I don't even want to find out how many are watching on, online right now. I'm sure they broke the counter. So. So anyway, thank you so much for coming tonight. It's wonderful to be able to do this in person again after, after all this time, you know, buried under under COVID. Anyway, um, tonight I would like to welcome you to the annual Sam Nikes Memorial Lecture. Uh, Sam Nikes was, of course, a pillar of the Greek community here for for decades. And when he died in 2006, his family endowed this lecture series uh, with which we are honoring his memory. So I would like to thank the Nikes family, Mrs. Jean Nikes, especially thank you. And we also here have uh, Pam Schaefer and, and Fritz Schaefer. Thank you all for being here and thank you for your generosity in endowing this lecture series. I think this is what the 15th, uh, it says on the program, but it's been uh, going on for several years now and we've had a series of distinguished speakers. Um, this year's speaker is Professor Louis Ruprecht Jr. Um, Professor Ruprecht uh, comes to us from Georgia State University in Atlanta. He's originally from New Jersey. And he went to Duke University to study to become an oceanographer, right? And he actually majors, majored in physics for the first three years of his university study, of his undergraduate studies. And then he went to an archaeological excavation one of those summers in Israel, and he saw the light and switched from physics to the humanities, especially to religious studies. Although I think, Louis, you did uh, graduate with a minor in physics still, you did. Yeah. So he's had quite an academic uh, background. He went on to uh, finish his MA in religious studies at Duke and then his PhD at Emory University. Um, before going to Georgia State University, he taught at various other places, including Princeton University and uh, Duke itself and Claremont University. And then he became the first at Georgia State, he became the first uh, William Sattles Chair in Religious Studies, a position that he ha has until now. In addition, he's also the director of the Center for Greek Studies, and I will explain to you his, his connection with Greece. Um, he has done a lot of diverse research. He has excavated, he has done archaeological excavations both in, his, in Israel and on Crete. Um, he has also done a lot of archival research uh, for the past uh, 12 years, I think. He has been a senior fellow at the Vatican Library. And currently, one of his most exciting programs uh, of research is a book that he found in the Vatican Library. Uh, is it 16th century? 16th century edition of ancient Greek female poets, uh, poetesses, and he's working on that right now. But uh, although he's geographically, his research is based in Greece and Rome, primarily in Greece, uh, in terms of themes, uh, he has cast a wide net. Uh, he researches the influence that ancient Greece has had on our culture in various different areas, but especially in ethics and politics. And actually, where that is concerned, he published a book several years ago about policing the state, and he updated that after the Ferguson events. So, so he drives, he re, draws this relevance, this relevance of Greek culture to modern, uh, to our own culture. So, politics, uh, democracy, ethics, uh, sexuality, and psychology, and also drama and film and tragedy. And more recently, as he's been working in Italy, he also started working on issues of aesthetics, aesthetic theory, and. Uh, the connections with ancient Greek art. So he has done all this amazing research. 
And actually, I was hoping to be able to change screens because I have on the other screen here his page with Google Books as an author because he's published more than 10 books and all of them are on exciting topics. And is it, is it possible to say that? No, no. So, 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 and these are books that, as I say, as I say, yeah, anyway, anyway, so, so, uh, I don't want to give you a long list of books, but, uh, and, and publications, but he's very prolific, uh, tens of scholarly papers in uh, uh, journals and uh, chapters in edited uh, volumes. So Lou is one of those people who has a breadth of intelligence and spirit that covers many areas of, of antiquity. Uh, his talk tonight is about an island and a topic that's very dear to his heart, Crete. And I know we have people here from the island of Crete. I'm so glad uh, to, to, to see you. So he will talk to us about Crete from Homer to Rome, mixing myths and monsters. Lou, thank you so much for coming here tonight. Okay. I'm just gonna test it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you for that incredibly generous introduction. Um, it's a great honor and really a personal pleasure to be with you this evening. I'm grateful to the family of the late Sam Nakis for promoting the important work of Greek studies here at the University of Missouri in St. Louis. Mr. Nakis formerly served as Supreme President of the Order of the HEPA, whose founding chapter, as many of you will know, is located in Atlanta. AHEPA's legacy of promoting compassion, equity, and social justice represents a proud commingling of the various moral commitments that we meet in Greek drama, in Greek philosophy, and in the Greek New Testament. This is a really distinguished lecture series, and after I was reading the list of former lecturers, I was a little daunted as well as honored to be invited to come. I'm really grateful to Michael and to Bob for your hospitality. Um, it's been a wonderful visit, um, albeit brief. And as Michael said, it's so good to be together in person again. When we first discussed the possibility of my joining you this evening, oh, I should say there will be no physics, a lot of literature, no physics. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I had all I could. When we first discussed the possibility of my joining you this evening, I saw this as an opportunity to speak about one of my first and oldest loves, the island of Crete. I first visited Crete when I was a graduate student under the auspices of the American School of Classical Studies summer program in Greek archeology. span We spent a week on the island, visited all of the main Minoan palaces, some important post-palatial mountain villages like Cavusi, as well as some dazzling Byzantine and modern churches. I was captivated, mesmerized. I'd never seen anything like it before. And I was determined to return. Maybe I should have stayed in physics just a little bit longer. Okay, it looks like it's going. All right, yeah, thank you. Thanks for checking too. So I did return over the next five summers as a volunteer on the excavation of what was then believed to be the pirate harbor of Philosophy here. I'm no longer confident in that designation for reasons I'll actually talk about this evening. I worked on a number of other Cretan excavations in subsequent years, most recently at some Paleolithic sites, whoops, Paleolithic sites on the southern coast here, and some Stone Age uh, cave images at the Espendu Cave in the interior here. Publications based on those later excavations tell a remarkable story. 
It now appears that Homo sapiens arrived on the sub southeastern coast of Crete some 200 to 300,000 years ago. They developed extensive Aegean trading networks for stone tools and other artifacts. They hunted the Cretan dwarf deer, you see, among other animals that populated the island before the last ice age. And they carved images of those deer in the floor of the cave at Aspendu in what are quite possibly the oldest examples of figural art ever found in Greece. Thus, it would appear that Crete, Homer's mythic island in the middle of a wine dark sea, has always been subject to repeated waves of human migration. The island's name identifies it as the mixed place, the place where wave after wave of human migration washed ashore and was absorbed added to the rich mixture of what it is to be Cretan. The island's name also provided the root for the English word syncretism, our technical name for that kind of robust mixture. As Greek mythology repeatedly emphasizes, complex things result when foreign things are mixed, humans and animals, humans and gods, various natural elements, human cultures, languages, even music. Greek mythology also suggests that such mixing is risky. It produces marvels as well as monsters, and the author of the mixture cannot control which it will be. How human beings have mixed on the island of Crete is a complex story to tell. There have been many stories about Cretan mixing, and I'm currently completing a book that will be entitled Marvelous Mixing, a cosmopolitan history of Crete. What I hope to show there is that the island of Crete has long been perceived as marvelous or monstrous, depending on a people's political persuasion. Crete was rendered as decidedly marvelous in the Minoan Bronze Age, which archaeologists like Sir Arthur Evans, John Pendlebury, Harriet Boyd Hawes, Federico Halbert, Ed Minos Calicarinos first rediscovered at the turn of the 20th century. Crete came to seem more mysterious in the classical period and in Plato's later work like The Laws, in which Crete is identified as representing a political possibility lying somewhere in between the alternative Athenian and Spartan systems. Men and women mixed together in the Cretan culture of Plato's day as they clearly seem to have done in the Minoan period. What this kind of mixing produced was complicated, as we'll see this evening. In the Roman period, Crete came to be seen in more monstrous terms by the Romans under the leadership of Pompey the Great, who waged a war against her alleged pirates at the end of the Republic. Crete is depicted as even more monstrously topsy-turvy by the author of the letter to Titus in the New Testament, an evangelist who sought to force the Christian, the, they're not the Christians, the Cretans, to change their mixed up ways. In this lecture, I'll suggest that Crete was not a land of pirates, but rather a land of complex possibilities defined by her remarkable capacity to absorb and to mix new arrivals. The uncanny richness of such cultural syncretism is evidenced by the synthesis of Arab and Byzantine elements in the 800s, and even more so by the synthesis of Byzantine and Venetian elements, which culminated in the so-called Cretan Renaissance in the 1500s. That mixing gave us the extraordinary painting of El Greco, as well as the epic verse of the Erotokritos by Vincenzo Conaris. That vernacular Cretan verse epic, the tale of two star-crossed lovers who are finally joined after many years apart, echoes a much earlier Homeric version that I'd like to look at more closely now. And so I'm turning to what is arguably the most subtle, the most sophisticated, and the most moving moment in this entire epic tradition, the late evening meeting between Odysseus, who is disguised as a beggar in rags, and his wife Penelope inside the palace they once shared together. This is the 19th book of the Odyssey. We should recall how the two came together this evening. Odysseus, who has been gone for more than 20 years, 10 years in the fighting at Troy and 10 more trying to make his way home, admittedly with stops along the way, 
has just been delivered to his home at Ithaca. He's revealed himself to his trusted shepherd, Eumaeus, and to his son, Telemachus. He's been secretly planning with them, trying to identify the best way to kill the would-be suitors who have occupied his palace, harassed his wife, tormented and consumed his household. It's a delicate situation fraught with real risk and danger. And for some reason, he does not reveal his identity to his wife. He has heard of what became of Agamemnon when he came back from Troy, butchered in his bath by his wife and her lover, and he is determined to avoid that fate himself. But interpretations of this meeting vary widely. Some think that Odysseus is spying on his wife, reassuring himself as to her fidelity and her virtue before he decides how to take his revenge. Others think that Odysseus is simply a product of the patriarchal values of his world, believing that women are too emotional to be trusted with secrets and that violent matters like vengeance and killing are best left to men. Others think that Odysseus is actually protecting his wife by keeping her far from a plot that may well fail. Better for her to be able to claim that she had no previous knowledge if it fails. Each of these interpretations assumes that Penelope does not know who this beggar is, a man who has arrived so suddenly and mysteriously at her palace with news of her husband, and yet with whom she carries on an intimate conversation late into the night. We should recall that the two characters who are most intimate with Odysseus and who love him best are also the two who know him best because they are his equal in cleverness. Both are female, the goddess Athena and his wife Penelope. We see many times in the Odyssey that Odysseus' special intimacy with Athena is born of mutual intellectual respect and a flirtatious joy in one another's capacity for deception. Athena loves the way Odysseus can lie. And even more subtly, she appreciates the way in which Odysseus can lie the truth. That's the thing I want to get at. Odysseus can lie the truth. I'll come back to that complicated notion several times. The intimacy which Homer shows us between Odysseus and Athena and between Odysseus and Penelope can seem so modern to modern readers that an explanation of how such an ancient story could seem so modern was needed. How, in other words, was the Odyssey poetically possible? How could an ancient poet manage to describe a type of human society that can simultaneously seem so patriarchal and so feminist in its moral commitments? The most charming answer to that question was offered by Samuel Butler a British satirist who published his revisionist account of the Odyssey in 1897. The title of that book, The Authoress of the Odyssey, pretty much tells the story. The Odyssey inhabits two worlds, or rather combines two worlds, domestic and epic, feminine and masculine, because this poem about a man's world was in fact written by a woman, and not just any woman, but a well-placed Sicilian noblewoman of the Bronze Age who was intimately familiar with the Iliad. This authoress also cunningly inserted herself into the epic in the figure of Nausicaa, the young girl who finds Odysseus beached after a shipwreck and takes him to see her parents. In other words, the authoress of the Odyssey was a make-believe man who lied the truth about domestic and foreign affairs as well as the upshot and the fallout from the Trojan War. She brought her feminine wiles to bear on her description of wily Odysseus, especially his lies. Now, Butler's book and his, his judgments about the essential differences between men and women of their differing wiles and weapons don't seem very convincing to a 21st century audience. It is striking, however, how the very mysteriousness and elusiveness of the Minoan civilization has tempted scholars to find on Crete, rather than Sicily, evidence of the last great matriarchy in the Mediterranean. More recently, a wonderfully creative classicist, the late John J. Winkler, took up Butler's thesis about the authoress of the Odyssey. 
His essay was entitled Penelope's Cunning and Homer's and appeared in this 1990 book, The Constraints of Desire. It's a really playful extension of Butler's work where Winkler points out how remarkably self-conscious of the Odyssey, uh, the author of the Odyssey actually is. Whether that author was a man or a woman no longer mattered. What matters instead is how very cunning the poet is, how very cunning poetry has to be. In Winkler's view of things, Homer was a make-believe Bronze Age hero who lied the truth about domestic and foreign affairs as well as the upshot and fallout from the Trojan War. The author of the Odyssey brought his or her poetic wiles to bear on the rich descriptions of Odysseus, especially his lies. I'd like to use the sensitivities that Winkler's work presents to look again at that meeting between Odysseus and Penelope in Odyssey 19. It's not at all clear whether Odysseus revealed himself to Penelope or not. In fact, he may not have needed to. There is ample evidence to suggest that she had already figured out who he was, or at least that she had her suspicions. If we take that ambiguity into account and make it the starting point for a reading of this late night conversation, then the poet's cunning is even clearer. The same conversation, the same passages have completely different meanings, depending on whether you assume that Penelope knows that the beggar is Odysseus, or at least that she suspects it. And depending on whether you assume that Odysseus knows that she knows, or suspects that she knows, or suspects that she suspects, and so on. These two cunning and well-matched spirits are dancing around one another by a late night fire, communicating important things by what they say honestly, by what they say falsely, by what they say ambiguously or mysteriously, or even not at all. Everything is happening on several levels. I'll point to just two examples. In the first, Odysseus tells Penelope that he has heard about Odysseus recently and that her husband is closer to home than she may think. He was recently seen and feasted in the rich land of the men of Thesprosia, and he is on his way home now, bringing many treasures back to his household. In fact, he tells her even stranger news, that since he lost his entire crew and cargo, this is the quote on the left, her husband could have come home before now, but he is gathering treasure to replace the one he lost. And he is now consulting the oracle at Dodona to see whether it's best to return openly or in secret to his homeland. His thorough descriptions of himself and his clothing bring his wife to tears. I think the passage on the right is incredibly moving. He knew how to say many false things that were like true sayings. And as she listened, her tears ran and her body was melted as the snow melts along the high places of the mountains when the west wind has piled it there, but the south wind melts it. And as it melts, the rivers run full flood. It was even so that her beautiful cheeks were streaming tears as Penelope wept for her man who was sitting there by her side. Viewed one way, this is torture. Subjecting his wife to these false stories with just enough truth in them to sting her the most. But viewed another way, Odysseus has just explained himself and his delay, and he has done so in terms that his equally acquisitive wife will understand and respect. He's late because he's been enriching their depleted household, and she's crying because she knows this is true. Lest we're seduced too quickly into simply pitying long-suffering Penelope, we should notice how she responds Responds to her husband's true falsehood. She meets his cleverness with cleverness of her own. And when she stops crying, the first thing she says is pretty interesting. Now, my friend, I think I will give you a test. She gives him several tests, in fact. The first is the one to which I've already alluded. She asks for a closer description of her husband and what he was wearing when her guest last saw him. He describes a robe she gave to her husband as a gift and she's brought to tears again from truthful memory. 
The next test is more supple and it takes time to unfold, assuming as I do that there is intention to what she's doing. First, she appears to respond to her guest's justification of Odysseus's long delay by rejecting it. She does not believe that Odysseus will ever come home. It's simply too late. She then makes arrangements for her impoverished guest to be bathed and bedded. She assigns this task to her aged servant, Eurycleia, who had been Odysseus, Odysseus's nurse as far back as when he was a child. This is a scene that was famously interpreted by Eric Auerbach in a chapter called Odysseus's Scar, where she washes his leg, sees a scar, figures out that it's him, and Odysseus threateningly warns her not to tell. Here's the thing about this. Penelope has put her husband into her nurse's hands. She arranged for Eurycleia to reveal his identity. If one woman knows who Odysseus is now, then presumably so would an even more clever second woman know. Penelope has been in any case within eye and earshot of this whole exchange. Now, Homer goes out of the poet's way to insist that Penelope didn't see anything. But if a poet's character can lie, then so can a poet. As eavesdroppers to this whole scene, we cannot help note it, but notice the poet's special pleading and once again wonder exactly what Penelope knows. Her behavior offers us a clue. Now she draws up a stool near the fire and confides in this anonymous guest. She tells about a dream which has disturbed her rest and asks him to interpret it. He interprets it positively as meaning that Odysseus is imminent. Penelope's not so sure. She tells her guests that dreams come to people through two doors, one made of iron and one made of ivory, and the ivory dreams deceive. She does not want to be deceived any longer. She doesn't want to dream any longer. Instead, she wants another test. This story we know. The test devised, that she devises requires each of the suitors to attempt to string her husband's ancient bow and shoot an arrow through 12 ax heads, which she will arrange in a row like timbers to hold a ship. And one thing more, she has just informed her cunning guest that she intends to have a husband tomorrow one way or another. Odysseus is out of time. Her guest tells her to arrange the plan without delay, and she, while wishing to remain and talk with him throughout the night, retires to her bedchamber. The scene is really touching, but it's really ominous at the same time. At the very beginning of this conversation, Penelope asked her guest to tell her where he was from. He resisted giving her this information, but when she presses him, he finally consents, crafting one of the most elaborate lies in the Odyssey. In a word, he is fallen royalty, and he hails from Crete. I'll just note the beginning. Crete is a land in the middle of a wine dark sea, lush and lovely with water all around. Countless peoples live there in 90 different cities, but they speak a mixed up language to one another. What I wanna propose here is that this description of Crete is the truth within the larger lie. And I want to highlight one single line in that lyrical description of Crete. While he refers to countless peoples living on the island and later lists the main groups, Odysseus observes that they speak a mixed up language, glossum mimigmena, to one another. I don't want to overplay the significance of this line, but I don't want to underplay it either. We have been told that there are many different peoples living on Crete and that they speak a mixed language in the singular there. This is a very different situation than one imagined by US style multiculturalism in which separate language enclaves tend to live and converse mainly with one another and have only limited engagement with other groups. The mixing on Crete was both more robust and more creative and somehow it seems to work. Now, lies are mainly a means of asserting control. Control of the situation, control of emotions, control of other people. 
This appears to be how Odysseus understands and uses lies. He protects himself by cloaking himself in a thick weave of lies. In fact, the conversation with his wife that I have just rehearsed is not the first time that Odysseus has pretended to be concrete. Rather, it's the fourth time. And all four times the lie takes place after he has made it home back to Ithaca. I'm not going to rehearse these, I promise, at the length of the fourth. But the first time he lies is to Athena. The Phaeacians, you'll recall, have left Odysseus on the shoreline with all of his booty. Weirdly, he's so exhausted that he sleeps through the whole thing. So he wakes up in a fog with no idea where he is. The mist has been enhanced by Athena to keep Odysseus and the people of Ithaca from knowing that he's returned. And after telling his lying story, Athena smiles and says, lies are near to you and in your very nature. And then she reveals herself to him and everything that he is still to endure. Shortly thereafter, Odysseus happens upon his old trusted swineherd, Eumaeus. They debate whether Odysseus will ever come home again. Eumaeus, who is doubtful, does not wish to speak of it. And so he asks the stranger where he's from instead. Odysseus's answer is really complicated and very involved. This is far and away his most elaborate Cretan lie. But I'm suggesting there's a truth in the lie. Quote, such was I in the fighting, but labor was never dear to me, nor care for my house, though that is what raises glorious children. But ships that are drawn by oars were dear to me always, and the wars. Eumaeus is sympathetic with this crazy story that he claims he's gone through and the crisscross fortunes of the man before him. But on one point, Eumaeus calls him a liar. Odysseus will not come home again. And yet that, we know, is the truest part of Odysseus's lie. Odysseus still disguised as a beggar, eventually makes his way to the palace in order to survey the situation. He observes the suitors who are consuming his household and attempting to marry into his fortune. He brings out a beggar's bowl and asks each of the suitors to share some food with him. The first and foremost of these suitors is Antinous, and the beggar stops before him to share another tale of woe. Antinous responds to this story first by condemning the stranger for being a downer and ruining the mood. He refuses to give him food and later hits him with a footstool. What we know is that he will be the target of a very particular retribution and very soon. And it is at this point that Penelope intervenes, complains to the suitors, and insists that they make room for hospitality to this stranger. And then a short time later, invents him, invites him for the private conversation I mentioned previously. So four lies. all associating Odysseus with Crete. To call them lies is, as I've tried to suggest, a bit of an oversimplification. There's a lot of truth in what Odysseus lies about, and there's even more intriguingly, a great deal of insight in how he characterizes things and people. There's a great deal of truth in how he characterizes himself. He is a man deeply concerned with the acquisition of wealth and the prestige it brings. He is not really a family man. He is, or at least he can be, dangerous. He has scruples, but he can be pretty unscrupulous too. He loves the sea and is attracted to adventure, but what attracts him involves danger and deep insecurity. There are pirates everywhere. Everybody lies, everybody cheats, everybody steals. People use him and he uses people. But no matter the circumstances, people seem to recognize something different perhaps exceptional, about Odysseus. So he's rewarded at least as often as he's cursed. If Odysseus comprehends himself, then he seems to comprehend Crete as well. I recall again that name, Crete, meaning the mixed place. Crete is also exceptional. This is a really great psychological painting of the Iliad and 
this is Idomeneus on my end. Idomeneus, the Cretan king, spent 10 full years at Troy, appears to have been relatively unharmed, and returned to Crete without a hitch when it was over. There is almost no Greek hero who can say that. Cretans seem to know how to fight. They also seem to know how to scheme, how to amass wealth through means fair or foul. They are, in Odysseus's casual terms, pirates. Mixing in the Odyssey has its darker side, as I noticed that the and I noted at the outset in Greek mythology, what comes of mixing are either marvels or monsters. Odysseus himself is depicted as both a marvel and a monster. So is another important mythological figure associated with Crete, Daedalus. As Sarah Morris has shown in a really wonderful book called Daedalus and the Origins of Greek Art, the mythic cycle that eventually linked Daedalus between Athens and Crete came relatively late, and much of it originated in Athens when Athens was first establishing its naval empire. This is just a highlight of the Daedalian Athens Crete linkages. This constellation of myths hinges upon the unintended consequences of technological change and the mixing of foreign elements. And all of this, both the marvels and the monsters, found a home on Crete. Many who reflected later on the island appear to me to have needed Crete to be one thing or the other. Mediterranean piracy had become a large and embarrassing problem for the Roman Senate in the period when they were transitioning from the Republic to the empire. We should bear in mind that these Mediterranean pirates did not always steal stuff in the way that Odysseus seems to have done. They also sometimes stole people in much the way that Odysseus claims had been done to him. A really important historical study published in 1924 by Henry Ormerud suggests that in general, the pirates' practice was as follows. They stopped and boarded Roman vessels. They identified wealthy Roman aristocrats, seized them, and then ransomed them back to their families. Plutarch reports that Julius Caesar was kidnapped by pirates as a young man of 17, and while, tra while he was traveling in the Eastern Mediterranean. He warned his kidnappers who he was and told them that he would return with an army and kill them all, which he did. But that was a personal vendetta. Not long after Julius's campaign, the Roman Senate declared an actual war on Mediterranean piracy. What kind of war this was and waged against what kind of pirates is actually a complicated question to answer. It's tempting to speak as if piracy were something relatively clear and self-evident, a kind of banditry by boat. And certainly piracy, as we normally use that term, is that. The ancient reality, however, was a great deal more complex. There have been some really fantastic studies of Mediterranean piracy in the Greek and Roman context, uh, starting in the late 19th century. But this last one, uh, De Souza's Piracy in the Greco-Roman World, is really a fantastic game-changing analysis, which I'm relying on here. These studies show us that the most generic Greek terms that were used to refer to piracy were listis, listia, or listeria. And that all of them possess the clear meaning of lawless banditry. This was already the term that Odysseus used in the Odyssey when claiming to be a pirate. He consistently calls himself Alistis when he lies. We find another term used later in the Hellenistic period, piratis, term that is related to a Greek verb for contest, struggle, and military attack. That term was used virtually interchangeably with listis by some of the major Hellenistic and Roman authors, such as Plutarch, Polybius, and Strabo. 
it was then transliterated into Latin as pirata, where our word comes from. Cicero famously claimed, and this is a quote that bears a lot more attention than I have time to give it. Pirates are not pirata, are not numbered among the legitimate enemies of war, but rather are the common enemy of all humankind. That, for a guy who's trying to generate a just war language, that's an incredible claim for what pirates are not owed. But the perception of piracy is, of course, in the eye of the beholder. Menelaus considered the Trojan princes to be pirates when they left Sparta with his wife. The over-the-top allied Greek response made them look like pirates too, in it only for the plunder of Troy. And yet we consider the Trojan War to have been an actual war, one waged between armies. Might we consider the Roman War on Mediterranean piracy also to have been a war waged between two or more armies? I believe that we can, and I think probably should, now, the traditional story of the Roman war on piracy goes that Julius Caesar's main rival, Pompey the Great, was given absolutely unprecedented power and authority in order to clear the Mediterranean Sea of pirates. His original mandate was the Lex Gabinius in 67 BCE, and it granted him authority to take over from any regional Roman commander within 400 stades or roughly 45 miles of the coast. That distance means that the entire island of Crete was under his control. He levied 120,000 troops, 20 legions, 4,000 cavalry, 270 ships. It's just a massive um, military expedition. And according to Sestier, the first great scholar of uh, Mediterranean piracy. In less than three months, this marvelous general had killed 10,000 pirates, made 20,000 more prisoners, seized 400 vessels, including 90 heavily armed ships, sank 130 others, and occupied 120 castles, forts, or refuges. He consigned to the flames entire arsenals and warehouses filled with weapons. That account was virtually the only way that Pompey's pirate war had been remembered until roughly 20 years ago. A revised view of this war begins with the observation that the Roman Senate had two areas of special concern, two places they always talked about. Cilicia on the southern coast of Asia Minor and Crete. And that, I think, is the clue to everything that followed. This was not so much a war against Mediterranean piracy as it was a war between armies. Crete was not a haven for bandits, but rather a well-organized confederation of allied cities, what was then called a Kinon. This Cretan alliance had humiliated an invading Roman fleet led by Mark Antony's father in 72 BCE. They were invaded and they destroyed the Roman fleet that had come for them. The humiliation was so severe that the Cretans sent an embassy to the Roman Senate to revive their treaty obligations to one another. But the Senate, angry, placed impossible conditions on the treaty renewal, which the Cretans refused. And that became the justification for a second Roman attack. That invasion was led by the Roman general, Metellus, and it was savage. Metellus had already landed on Crete before Pompey even received his commission for the pirate war. And Metellus refused to cede his authority to Pompey. The Cretans actually were begging to surrender to Pompey because they'd get a better deal. Metellus was ravaging the island. In a word, this was not a pirate war on Crete. The Cilician case is equally instructive. The southern coast of Asia Minor was an even more extensive Kinon than the one on Crete. The historian Appian noted that the Cilicians could field armies and sailors numbering in the tens of thousands. 
The Cilicians specifically refused the name Listis when they were called that and insisted that their gains were entirely spoils of war. They had subjected several Roman fleets to humiliating defeat. So this was the theater of war that Pompey took control of personally. This too was not a pirate war in Cilicia. The fact that it was all over so quickly, Pompey was given three years and it was over in less than three months. So quickly suggests that something more than Pompey's military genius was involved. It suggests that he was eager to take this army elsewhere. And in fact, the Roman Senate immediately commissioned Pompey to ride the wave of this momentum and to take his forces inland to go after the forces of Mithridates. So this alleged Mediter war on Mediterranean piracy actually ended far to the Asian interior and finally put an end to the Mithridatic wars that had consumed Rome for more than a generation. In other words, the claim of Cretan piracy may be one more Cretan lie. In short, the Cretan wars of the Romans used the pretense of piracy as a means and justification for conquest. The Roman armies which landed in Cilicia used this same logic and justification to extend their military influence as far as Syria and Jerusalem. We are really far from the ocean. Jerusalem is where Pompey's pirate war ended, in fact. It was thus through the Roman wars against alleged Mediterranean piracy that Rome came to Palestine and a new chapter in the history of Mediterranean religion began. I would offer as a pretty important historical note, according to the Synoptic Gospels, Jesus was accused of being a Listis and he was executed together with two other Listis by the Romans in Jerusalem. So there's a deep connective thread between this pirate war and an emerging religious movement in Roman Palestine. And that's where I want to sort of move briefly before concluding. Crete's early Christian history is as elusive and as intriguing as the pirates. There's evidence to suggest that Christianity came very early to the island of Crete. One theory is that Paul's famous shipwreck landed him on the small island of Davide off the southern coast, not far from where human beings first appear to have arrived hundreds of thousands of years before. There was certainly a large Christian basilica in the Roman capital of Gorton already in the fourth century, the remains of which you see on the left. The evangelical success makes Crete's appearance in the New Testament book of Titus even more strange. The letter is ascribed to Paul, the apostle of the Gent to the Gentiles, but it is not a theological letter. Rather, the letter to Titus is a political letter. Titus has been sent to Crete or left there in order to organize the place one polis at a time. Paul is very concerned that Titus find the right kind of people with the right sort of character for each of the main positions within the Christian hierarchy. And that's how the letter to Titus begins with a concern of who, what kind of person we need for a bishop, what kind of person we need for the male presbyters, what for the female presbyters, and even what kind of quality is required of ens enslaved Christians. The letter's repeated references to good works, not something Paul usually talks about, makes us wonder why Paul would ever write that way. And in a word, it's because he is writing to a Christian organizer about an imagined version of Crete. You emphasize the aspiration to good works in a place or among a people where there are none to be found. In other words, among a certain set of Cretans who look for all the world like Odysseus. The way this letter imagines the island is fascinating. Everyone drinks, no one obeys, not men, not women, not children, not enslaved people. 
men take multiple wives and everyone takes other people's stuff. We have met that world before. What comes next is one of the stranger passages in the New Testament. One of their own, one of the Cretans' own, a prophet of theirs said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, bottomless bellies. This witness is true. It sounds for all the world as if Paul in this letter is concerned that Crete can taint, taint virtually any church or doctrine. And in fact, he concludes the letter by pretty much saying that. There is just no talking ultimately to a person from Crete. It would be like trying to win an argument with Odysseus. Now, this is all funny as far as it goes, but it raises a really significant question to me. Who are these people actually talking about? Who do they really have in mind? The Romans engaged in a war against alleged pirates, Christian organizers, trying to organize an allegedly completely chaotic um, Greek environment. One answer suggests the very hypothesis I've been trying to play with in this lecture. They have Homer's Odysseus in mind, and more specifically, the Cretan pirate Odysseus pretended to be when he first made his way home. In other words, well after the demise of the independent Greek world, and the rise of the Roman Empire, certain legends about Crete persisted throughout the Mediterranean. The Roman war against piracy, as well as this strange and elusive New Testament letter, may both be read as evidence for the vast cultural echo created by the Homeric poems, which is why I spent half of this lecture talking about Homer. I think he's crucial to understand the actual political and religious events that take place hundreds of years later. They attest to the power, if not to the truth, of Odysseus's lies, and thus they attest to the vast rhetorical power of that mysterious authoress of the Odyssey. Thank you very much. Uh, we the floor to questions. We have a few more questions, comments. Why do you think there is this connection in the initial connection between the and I really, that's the part of this I wish I knew. I mean, I, if, if the Odyssey is sort of an origin story for this whole very rich and common trope of Cretan lying and Cretan piracy, um, why, why would it have been a, a meaningful trope in Homer is, is really the question. And I really don't know. The thing that I'm wondering about is if Crete was clearly understood as different and its difference was due to the fact that many peoples came there, stayed there, mixed there, creating something distinct and different, then that created an obvious target for a certain kind of poetic suspicion. Yeah, I mean, um, and if you look at the entirety of Cretan history, it's really interestingly out of sync with the Greek history I learned in college. Um, we, after the discovery of the Minoan materials, we know something quite different and distinct and much more mixed was happening in Bronze Age Crete than was happening on the mainland. Um, they stay relatively neutral and unallied in the Peloponnesian War. They, there are so many hugely significant historical moments in my learning of classical Greek history that Crete is outside of. And Crete's description in Plato's Laws is absolutely fascinating. I mean, the entire thing sets up three political systems, Athens, Sparta, and Crete. I really am not clear. I spent a lot of time trying to figure out what was the system in Crete that made it so different. One of the things that keeps coming up is mixed constitution. I mean, everywhere you turn, 
mixing on Crete seems to be both the occasion for creativity and the occasion for potential monstrosity or problems. So it's it's mixed, it's hybridized, and that's complex. Please. Yes, sorry about that. But lies are complicated. I mean, yeah. Well, so thank you for that question. I, in my view, the the monstrous depiction of Crete um, is a really characteristic feature of the early Roman period. I think it's clearly a trope that justifies the pirate wars, and it seems to be a pretty clear trope that continues into the period of early Christian formation. Ironically, at the same time, that Crete seems to be successfully evangelized quite early. So there's a there's a differentiation between the trope of the monstrous and actual Christian success there. The later periods, I do think um, Crete is remembered in a much more positive way. I mentioned the Arab period is actually really interesting, and you could just as easily say the Arabs are Cretanized as the Cretans are Arabized. They end up all being Cretan, and that's even the, more the case, I think, in the Venetian period. So moving forward, I think the mixing of cultures on Crete starts to be perceived as more generative. Um, but I would say still today, you know, generalizations are difficult, but you certainly, a conversation I have quite frequently in Crete is, you know, I'll usually say something about, oh, you know, I love it here, or it's always great to be back here, and I'll pretty regularly be asked, Greece or Crete? So, so you know, there's a, I think there's both a pride of a distinctive, and, and they join the nation quite a bit later. Um, they don't join the nation until 1912. So they're a late comer to the Greek nation state. And there's a certain sense of, of distinctiveness that's a point of pride, perceived by others as a point of separateness. And it also depends where you go in Crete. I mean, there are lots of sub, um, sort of subsets of that, of that view, if that, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think absolutely, and as per the earlier comment, that mixing, again, the big takeaway is mixing can be perceived as monstrous or marvelous, and it has a lot to do with the prior perception of the person who's seeing. Um, I think what's really interesting about your question, just, just in terms of the Odyssey, I mean, there's so much to say about why does Odysseus keep returning to making himself a Cretan pirate? Why is that the lie of choice? I guess one thing, apart from envy, I mean, we can envy many things. Uh, creative culture is one, and that, that's one way to read some later Minoan history. But another obvious one is, is wealth. So Crete is surprisingly, it's a real crossroads of culture, but that also means a crossroads of commerce, which is why it's important that this incredibly early arrival on the southern coast, there are already trade trade networks. They're already trading with other islands, which means they've got a language in common. They've got all the things that make sense of the truth in Odysseus's line. So envy of wealth, I think, can be a piece of you know, well, was that wealth produced by a very robust willingness to absorb and accommodate new arrivals? Which I think, at least for now, that seems to me a really productive way to think of Crete overall, just waves after waves of human arrivals. And Crete is really a palimpsest today. There are these traces of all these peoples and cultures that have come through and they've, they've 
contributed to the mix, if you will. But so envy of wealth and perhaps the wealth is a product of traders are cosmopolitan. They sort of have to be, you know, and uh, probably sailors too. Sure, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, on the one hand, you think, well, Magna Grecia, right? Like um, it's colonized, it, it should be. Honestly, I don't, I don't know as much about, I've only been to Sicily once. And um, so I'm not sure. I, to my knowledge, here's maybe the thing that can, well, there's two things I wanna say about that. One is it's very striking to me that the cycle of Daedalus myths, even if they're late and even if they're primarily Athenian in origin, they take us from Athens to Crete, but he ends in Sicily. When he finally invents wings and gets off the island, when he loses his son, he just goes into self-exile in, in Sicily. So why that you know, transit um, Crete to Sicily? The other piece of this, though, is to my knowledge, the Cretans didn't colonize, like the, all the colonies in Sicily aren't, Crete, Crete isn't seeding colonies in Sicily, I don't think. I think they're all mainland cities that are colonizing. So Crete has this very unusual place, it seems to me, in the broader context of the, the enormous span of what we consider Greek history. That's, that's, Sicily is though kind of a mysterious piece of this I'm not sure about, which is something I need to, yeah, exactly, exactly, um, exactly. That, that's the million dollar question for me. Um, and th that's why I said, I don't wanna make too much of one line from the Odyssey, but I don't wanna make too little of it either. What Odysseus says, and he ticks off a bunch of different peoples that are there, you know, again, in the context of a lie, maybe he's making it up, but I really am committed to the idea that the description of Crete is the truth within the lie and would have been heard that way by, a Homeric audience. So he's he's describing something about the mixed place that would be recognizable, whatever that means to, to your point. The the part I, I'm I'm puzzling over is Odysseus describes a place with all of these peoples who come and are living together, but they speak a mixed language, you know, singular. And maybe that's because the poetic meter needed that word. I don't, but he says multiple peoples speaking, speaking a mixed language singular to one another. How do you know? How do you read that? Is is it at this point a form of Greek language that is just far more open to foreign loan words and and significant changes in grammar? Is it a form of Greek that's willing to permit its dialect to become un? intelligible on the mainland. That, to me, that's the best sense I can make of the world he's describing. But permitting the language to be dynamic and change is quite an extraordinary thing. Permitting the culture to, to flow and change is pretty extraordinary. And to identify that as a marker of its distinction, rather than, you know, it's the Wild West, I think is incredibly interesting because the, the broader description makes it sound like a place that miraculously for whatever reasons works 90 cities with no defensive walls and then they're doing they're mixing in a way that has not generated fault lines that we often associate 
with ethnic or religious mixing. And that the broader project, I'm interested in that, that do we have, a, can we come up with a model of what it would mean for peoples to mix in a way that really was generative? Like it's easy to forget, particularly I think in the Balkans that people freely intermarried, were ethnically diverse, practiced more than one religion, spoke more than one language. I mean, the mixing was far more robust than what I think we tend to tend to imagine in the modern period. And that seems to me what's intriguing about ancient history, uh, ancient Cretan history. Um, so I wish, I wish I had a better answer for that, but that's really, I mean, he says it works. How did it work is really the incredible. What's that? Yeah, and that, and that would be, which takes us back to cosmopolitan, how cosmopolitan sort of merchant trading cultures are, particularly port cities and naval sort of cultures, all the things we associate largely with Greece that are intensely present on Crete because of where it's located and how it seems to have operated. So yeah, I think there's really something to that. Um, but it's also marked as different. Even Odysseus of Lies, he's describing it as that place in the middle of the sea where something really intriguingly different seems to be happening and where people seem to want to go, whether to raid or for some other reason. And it's as linked to North Africa as it is to Asia Minor and the Greek, Greek mainland. It's physically and culturally a really significant crossroads and is for millennia, which I think is a way of trying to intellectualize why I fell in love with it when I first went there. Really, um, its differentness is, is something I've tried to understand from the first time I went. Thank you. Thank you so much for your invitation. I really appreciate it. So um, he says he hopes he wasn't too complicated. It wasn't because we're used to looking at history at looking at history in a linear way with chronological events and in boxes. And then you give us another perspective here how things interconnect and uh, these connections are not, are not always apparent and obvious. So we appreciate this new perspective. Thank you very much. Homer is almost. Of course. Um, I, I should tell you that before he goes down that he is doing an amazing job with Greek studies at Georgia State University. He has, there's a vibrant program in Greek studies, quite similar to our own with uh, lots of uh, academic programs and uh, programs for outreach and the public. So, and actually in 2021, he was decorated by the president of Greece with a gold cross of the Order of Phoenix. So we are all grateful here, both as Greeks and as academics for everything we are doing for Greece. Thank My you. My paperwork was just submitted. I'll be a Greek citizen too. Oh, congratulations. That's great. You seek your, seek your Michael. <laughs> <laughs> well, there was a, yeah. I'd love to. Oh, I'd love to. No, no. <laughs> oh, I. It's one of my favorite places in the world. Absolutely. Oh, I'd love to. There's so much to say about contemporary. I'd love to. We'll bring him back. I'd love to bring him back. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, with this, uh, let me thank you again for coming tonight. Students, I need to see you at the end. Uh, other than that, the next event will be on March the 21st. It will be the Matsakis Lecture, and we will also have an event to honor the memory of Nick Caracas. Uh, more information will be coming about that soon. Uh, in April, the last event of the series will be a concert, April 27th dedicated to Maria Callas because UNESCO is celebrating the 100th anniversary of Maria Callas. So we'll have uh, a soprano, Stella Marku, 
perform uh, arias uh, for which Maria Callas was famous. Thank you so much for coming and I hope I'll see you in our next event. Thank you.